I'll sit for a bit on it if you don't mind. Um, my name is Jörg is Kilkoyne, Kil and um, I'm a uh, parish priest in County Mayo in Ball near Knock. I'm actually a parish priest in two parishes, which is uh, another side of the times, uh, and I'd ask for a quiet parish, so I got two quiet parishes. <laughs> it was the best they could do for me. So I'm Ball and Mayo Abbey. Mayo Abbey is completely rural, very historic, and it was once very famous back in about the oh, 7th century or thereabouts. And it never really, never really kept it going or, or, or got back, got back to its early fame. It was very famous for Saxon monks, so it's also known as Mayo of the Saxons. Uh, the Saxon monks used to come to, to study there. Um, so I'm in, I'm in the very heart of County Mayo, and um, I, I suppose in the heart of the situation we're in. Uh, I was in Athenry right before that. Um, in that uh, the church in the north is probably a bit stronger than in the south, I'm sure you're aware of that. Although northern people warn me when I am too impressed by that to be careful because it's moving, it's moving in the north, it's just more slowly for obvious reasons, it's more, more complex history. But in the south, it's, it's, um, it's pretty much a modern European country at this stage, with all that that entails, and positives as well. Um, the situation is developing in the South, I mean the cultural and political situation is developing in the South with a predictability that is actually startling. Uh, sometimes predictability is startling. You predict something, but it's quite shocking when it obligingly happens. Uh, in the same way as you can, on a sad note, you can expect a death in your family. If somebody could have been a long time down, you may be looking after them. It's still an awful shock when it actually happens, uh, which is strange because you think you could be more prepared for it. And in the same way, I suppose, you know, the, uh, the, the first of the referendum, the, the 2015 referendum on, on marriage, um, that was a very significant referendum. That was hugely significant, uh, philosophically, culturally. Uh, and it was passed to a, to a considerable extent on sentiment. You know, it was a masterly manipulation of sentiment. But at the end of the day, as John McGork reminded us in an article, it's John, isn't it? The man who gripped. Yeah. In an excellent article, he, he, he advised Catholics, do you remember the way we were all going on? If only we'd done this, if only we'd done that. A few years later, a abortion was passed in a landslide. You know, in a, a landslide. And I thought we'd lose abortion, but that we'd lose it very, be very tight. And, you know, tomorrow's another day. We were hammered. It was a decisive rejection of tradition and values. And really of Irishness as it was understood. It was the end of Irish Catholicism, I thought. Uh, as it was known. There'd be something else would be there, but it wasn't what we had known. And I remember McGurk saying, you know, that we need to stop going on. If only we'd done this, if only more of the priests had spoken. The priests, a lot of the priests were cast, by the way. I just want to say that. No, no, just so I'm not, I'm not, you know, sort of defending my own crowd and, and just blaming it on the lazy or something. No, I thought, I thought the leadership was dying. And people tend to blame the bishops, which is unfair, actually, that, that it was a massive failure among the priests. It was, it was very terrible. And McGurk said, look, the Irish people want this. He said, they don't. He said that there really is no point of these endless post-mortem. So the Irish people made a decision. That's not a narrow victory. That's a huge victory. Something has happened. It's seismic. It's huge. And so that's where we're at. Now we have, we have what should we all say next to be? Euthanasia. What's coming? Euthanasia. It's, it's, it's actually startling and predictable. And it's, it's coming. You'd like to think that Ireland would be um, touchy, briary, edgy, unpredictable, but no, we're going exactly the same way. There was an old bishop, I think, in Dublin in the past. I think he was Don, was it Don? He was John Charles Auxiliary. He was there for years. He was still there when I was a young man. And I think he used to say, every ism comes to Ireland to die. <laughs> they wash up with Ireland. And Ireland goes, oh, the latest thing. <laughs> and, and, and we fall for it. And so we're, we're doing this. And this is the thing we'll go through. 
again handled in a masterly way. Evie Ray was chairing the committee, a uh, traditionalist, or at least an avowed traditionalist, um, all the rest of it. But as far as I know, only three of the committee really went against the overall conclusion, which was that assisted dying. It's recommended, they're recommending to government. You know about that, the All Party Parliamentary Committee that sat on it. A very thorough report, very readable by the way, it's there on the government website, and they're recommending to the government that assisted dying be brought in under, of course, any number of caveats and restrictions. Very intelligent restrictions, except they're not going to last, as we know. You know, once this starts, the nature of the common law, the nature of the way things go, it'll be be wiped. You know, it'll be wiped. Um, and they knew the hate speech though. So we tightened this talk behind enemy lines, the Catholic resistance, which was slightly puckish. You know, it was an attempt to annoy people a bit and be a little bit edgy. But in point of fact, any of you could, could have come up with the same thing. The behind enemy lines, as some of you know, that's Caesar's. You know, where he was saying, you know, why are some Christians getting so upset about the fact that that the world doesn't like them. He said, do you realize that they're operating behind the lines? Do you know what we are? You know, it's as if you're, you're going around, you've escaped from Stalag 40, you're going around with a, 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 an educated British accent, uh, probably maybe still wearing prison gear, and you're asking all these Germans, you know, the train, time, train timetable, and you're wondering why they're looking a bit lift. <laughs> and they're looking you up and down. And in the same way, you know, that he's saying, you know, why do you expect to be so acceptable? You know? So I, I, I suppose really what the point I want to make here is that the situation we're in is actually probably so authentically Christian that it actually is terrifying. And I think that's at the heart of our fear and our loneliness and our being dispirited is that we didn't sign up for this, you see. I know we did. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know you're Catholics and you know, you knew what you were doing and all the rest of it, you know. But, you know, people get married and they spend a whole lifetime getting to know each other. And that doesn't always go well. <laughs> I remember a friend of mine saying about her husband, I look at that fellow sometimes and I don't love him. <laughs> and, and they did good marriage. That was years ago, they're still married like, you know. And they seem to like each other. <laughs> Too much love. You know? No, but I mean, in the, in this, it, it, it takes a long time to learn this. Is is we follow a man of sorrows. Hey, Catholics forget. You know, we've crucifixes everywhere, and I know we made the crucifixes cuddly. I mean, who thought you could do that? That's it. Fairness. That's good going. I mean, a crucifix is an absolutely horrendous image. It's only because we're used to it that we don't notice that. And we actually managed to make the crucifix cuddly from about the 60s on. You know, the indistinct figures. I have a lovely cuddly crucifix in that. Really, is, it really is lovely. It wouldn't offend a comment. <laughs> it's the loveliest crucifix. You'd be proud to be nailed to it. <laughs> it looks comfortable. Whereas, I mean, if you see one of the old Spanish crucifixes, have you seen those? And the blood is pouring off and like in every sinuous string of Spanish novel. <laughs> okay. You know one of those old traditional crucifixes? You find them in some Irish churches because a parish priest back in the 19th century or early 20th went on holidays and bought one and brought it back. Also from Bavaria. It's amazing what you'll find in country churches in the west of Ireland. Yeah. Um, so it's really interesting stuff. But no, we made it cuddly. It's, it's untrending. I mean, look at the Shroud of Turin. That may not be authentic, but it, I mean, the evidence is increasingly intriguing. It's just absolutely intriguing. Um, if it's a fraud, like the guy who's a towering genius, one of the, one of the great anonymous geniuses of the Middle Ages, uh, it, the fraud was so detailed. And, and uh, I mean, if, if, the, if the shouting to him is authentic, the crucifixes aren't good. Now, why do you think the church, which found the cross so obnoxious that it doesn't appear in the first few centuries of Christian art, why do you think the church eventually made its peace with the crucifix and has adopted it? It's because the church discovered the hard way that the cross is central to the Christian vocation and that we are 
behind the enemy lines. And if you don't feel that, that's because you've been narcotized by a temporary cultural alignment, a political alignment between church and culture, which is actually far more dangerous than the situation we're in. I, I just want to leave that with you. Um, I, I realize that you may not be in the form for this on a Thursday night. You, um, you may want something more restful, um, a little bossa nova in the background, maybe. <laughs> or, I don't know. Uh, I'm from Mayo. I mean, we don't do this. <laughs> I just don't want to say to you there. You know? um, this is where we're meant to be. We actually have a chance to be the real thing. Now, I know you'd say, oh, you're insulting our ancestors who were devout Catholics in such hard times. They were devout Catholics in fantastically hard, let, let's go back into the early 20th century, back into the 19th, in fantastically hard material times, in materially hard times. But they were Catholics in time of great unity about the faith. And they were in a pretty well catechized church from about the mid 19th century. But certainly the late, you know? I mean, don't forget the late. Phenomenal missionary outreach in the first 50 years of Catholic Church in, in, in Ireland in the 20th century. The first 50 years of the 20th century. It was phenomenal. It was phenomenal that a neighbor of mine, a, a small farmer's daughter, joined the Kilachandra nuns. You know the nuns who were Kilachandra? The, I can't remember the name. They, they were Sierra Leone and places like that. Yeah. yeah. They, they did amazing work. And she goes out there. Now they, they were bright. The family were bright. Now. She goes out there. She ends up a surgeon. As this girl from the West Coast of Mayo ends up a respected surgeon. She built hospitals. It was incredible. Like, I'm just saying, the, the only thing is that that never lasts long. And it's really dangerous. Because you, 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 it narcotizes you. You don't, you don't feel the pain of the cross as much because everyone is together. You know, the old generals used to talk about the feel of cloth. Have you ever heard that phrase? I first heard it from the military, the fantastic military historian, British military historian John Keegan. He's dead now. Not long ago. And he tells it in one of his books. Um, very readable, by the way, if you come across him. Keegan, John Keegan. It's a Irish poet. And uh, the feel of cloth was back to the 18th century, where you remember they used to march in squares. And they'd, they'd work them like a draft board, you know, the general. And they'd move in squares towards the enemy, and the enemy would fire away at them once they came into range. But they kept going towards them. And the trick was to take as much punishment as you could, but move as fast as you could in a disciplined manner to the point at which you could make a bail of charge. Yeah? Now, it took phenomenal nerve to hold your, your place. And if a guy fell in front of you, you would just step into his place. Yeah? I mean, that took enormous nerve to do that. You'd keep marching, straight, like this, and the enemy pouring fire into him. And they used to talk about the feel of cloth, which was the rough cuffs of the uniforms rubbing off the cuffs of your men. The uniforms were heavy, rough material. And it gave you a natural sense of the pack, the herd. And the generals would say there was nothing like the feel of cloth. Steady in that, steady in that. Can't be down. Because you've got them around you. We had the feel of cloth. Yeah? The huge missionary outreach, the regiments. We had a spiritual empire. I know people laugh nowadays when it's talked about. We followed the British Empire. Irish police went anywhere the Brits were. Because they, they tell you English tended to be one of the languages that were used there, and it was convenient. Nigeria and all the rest of them. But lots of Nigerians really like us. Nigerians who have never met an Irish person in their lives and probably wouldn't like us if they did meet us. <laughs> really like us. <laughs> because these Irish priests, the Holy Ghost Fathers of that, do the nuncio we had the I remember him talking about it. The, the last man of Kolo, he was um, an Igbo. The Igbo thought the word of the Irish. You know? I, I mean, it was an incredible achievement. 
an incredible achievement. But we're back to reality. I remember, I, I was years in St. Gerald's College in Chew, and you know, there was never much money in the Church of the West. And Gerald's looks pretty much like a fairly well-run uh, boarding school out of Charles Dickens, like, you know, which is what it was. <laughs> you know, it's grim, it's grim looking. They put Ivy on the front, which helped a lot. Okay, but when I was there, she was just a bear. <laughs> so it was, it was a, grim, a grim, it was a grim looking, looking place, you know. And and I I I, I, rem I remember our our being there, and and uh, you could sense that there was still the faith there. It was a strong Catholic school. It had been founded in the penal times. One of the oldest Catholic schools in the country, secondary school, 1800. It was founded with a license from the Protestant Archbishop. Mm -hmm. They still have the license. Um, uh, it was an incredible achievement. They operated in patched cottages in the town for about 20 years before they could buy a bankrupt bank. Went bust and got a lot of cheap. Um, and yet, looking back, you could see that the thing was ending. It was a very, how would you put it? It, it? The roots weren't deep of what we were doing. I think Frank Duff had a sense of this much earlier. What, whatever was, I think Frank Sheed, the American evangelist, came to the same conclusion on a visit here. It, it's incredible. Is that that incredible achievement, and yet the roots were getting shallower, even as we did it. The more we achieved, the less rooted we were. And then eventually the whole thing came down like a, like a house of cards. It's a, it's, a, it's a remarkable thing. And so here we are now. The Irish Church never had a huge amount of money left, you know? And, um, but we ended up with a huge property portfolio. We've all these houses. We've all this property. And hardly anyone in them. And we're a bit like the old gentry. You know, they ended up in these big houses and then they couldn't afford the servants because the, you know, the, servant, the, the locals got uppity and they wanted higher wages and, and so it got dearer. And, and then, you know, they, they live in one room until the ceiling fell in and they move into the next room. And every so often, you know, they go on a hunt and get drunk on a bit of stir and, you know. Uh, I, I don't know. The, you know what I'm talking about. And gradually it decayed and decayed. And we're in the same boat. A friend of mine said to me lately, when we were talking about churches, because we're going to have to decide what churches were closed, uh, and that's closer than we think. And he said, should we get no more talking about how, how will we sell them and this kind of thing? He said, they'd probably fall in by the side of the road like the Protestants. He's right. You know, I mean, the Protestant churches have been falling in by the side of the road for years in the south. You know, uh, and um, that's the way we're going. And I suppose, in the context of all of that, I'm telling you, we've never had it so good, which is a ridiculous thing to say. We have never had it so good. We have a chance to live a more authentically Christian life than even the devout pre or devout predecessors didn't have a chance to live clean. They had a whole load of social stuff to deal with, a whole load of politics, a whole careful set. You, you, my poor stepfather, the Lord's mercy, he was never the most diplomatic. He got up with my ordination and he said, I want to congratulate Father Brendan, he said. And uh, I think he'd be a good priest, he said. My mother, he said, always said, if you have a pig or a priest, you're elected. <laughs> she was a fittest triangle. You know, it was my ordination day, and they were trying to be a bit posh. <laughs> there was fear to that. And there was a roar of appreciation from the crowd, who had all clearly heard the same problem. And of course, it was because, you know, priests were comparatively well off. They had an income. Hmm. At a time when many people didn't. Or sometimes they were far better off than their predecessors. And now we give out about the African priests sending money home. 
Do. You see, the Irish priests in America send money home to their parents. I mean, do, do, do you see? We're, no, we're, we're in a good place. We're, I'm not just saying that hysterically to make myself feel bad. Okay, we're in a good place. We're in a good place. <laughs> and the whole thing falls in on <laughs> I'm not. We are in a good place. It doesn't feel like it. It doesn't look like it. That's because we don't meditate on the cross. We don't do this anymore. I, oh, let me give you an example, okay? Let me give you an example. I went out to a parish priest working at the weekends when I was a student at home 40 years ago. And of course, Italy was far ahead of us and all this stuff. It's an incredibly sophisticated society. But still with a lot of tradition. You know, and the parish priest was a real disappointing Vatican II man, you know, he didn't go far enough, <laughs> you know, and, and he was there, and he, he, he was given out about the old pietists, you know, and he, he, he told me this prayer the men of say, in the seminary, and you went out through it. Now, I can't remember it in English, never mind in Italian, but it was a pretty tough prayer, like, and it was, you know, it was, uh, when these eyes no longer see, oh dear Lord, remember me. When these hands no longer feel, oh dear Lord, remember me. And you went down, when you went down your body, like, you know. When these feet no longer walk, oh dear Lord, remember me. In other words, when I am totally vulnerable and facing death, Lord. And he said, what, a, what an awful prayer. He said, I never said it since I left the seminary. And I remember thinking at the time, that actually wasn't a bad prayer. If you had the belly foot. All right, you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to have a few on you. But, I mean, no, but, I mean, Here's the thing. Keep in mind we're behind enemy lines, right? Right? You're watching sleepwalkers. Does that occur to you? You're watching lemmings. And they're all rushing towards the cliff. And if you meet another lemming, they go, oh, jeez, the crack, crack. We're out for the day. <laughs> you go into the cliff. <laughs> I hear, I hear it's brilliant. <laughs> I've been looking forward to this for so long. And if he said cheaper, I don't know about this, I don't like to look at that. <laughs> you know, the others are not all weird. <laughs> you know? That prayer actually wasn't far off. I'm not suggesting you need that prayer, you can do it otherwise. This society has no answer, and knows it has no answer, and doesn't claim to have an answer, and hides the fact that it has no answer to any of the truly great questions. It has no answer. The only thing that's guaranteed is that you're probably, if you're looking, this is clover, this is clover. You end up in a decent nursing home, and they're getting better. Okay, I'm sure. I take an interest in these things now. Uh, <laughs> being called loving by a nice person you don't know. Okay? And being handed your goodie. Do you remember goodie? I mean, you know, to me, I met a nail. Goodie was, was stale bread mixed into hot milk with sugar, which was a big treat. Sorry. <laughs> Look forward to it. <laughs> There'll be a modern version of it. What I'm trying to say to you is, there is no answer to this. I know you're going to say back to me, they discovered to make us live longer. Okay, how much longer? And what are you going to look like by then? Okay, you'll be sitting there, you'll have two artificial legs, one artificial hand, half your brain has been replaced, one eye has been replaced. Okay, you're mostly cyborg. Okay. You can't go near magnets and you can't go through airports. Okay. <laughs> yeah, they can, they, they'll probably learn to make a little bit longer. And after that, you'll die. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> and, and it's right. Here we go. One of the funniest and most terrifying things I saw was on a program about American jails. And there was this guy, and they were getting them ready for the electric chair. <laughs> and you know what the warden said to him? He said to him, he's being really nice to him. He said, now we'll send you up, you know, your last meal and that kind of thing. He said, we're going to get through this together. <laughs> like, no. <laughs> he's going to get through it. <laughs> the other guy will get frightened. <laughs> That's what society is saying to you. That's what society is saying to you. We we'll get through this together. Now, my, my, my mother died last year, it was, which was hard for us. We nursed her for about a year. Before her time, she had a brain tumor. She wasn't young, but she wasn't 
of Rome now. And I thank God for palliative care. They were angels from heaven. They were so good to us, they were so good to her, there was some knowledge from mankind. I'm not knocking that, or anything like that, or all the good things that have come with society. I'm just saying that what palliative care does is kind of just calm you down and keep you comfortable. And I'm just asking, you know, because we're behind enemy lines, remember? I'm just asking in a whisper, should you be calm? I mean, is, is, is that okay? Is, is death okay? You, you should be calm. It's okay to be fine. And how do they know? No, the angels, the lovely people around you. I'm not knocking them. I'm just saying Catholics have no choice but to be this disagreeable and unpleasant. There is no choice. Because I'm presuming if you're Catholic, you believe in absolute objective truth. Okay? So you just keep at this. Have we any hope? Is there anything to be had? If there is nothing to be had, should you be calm? I will put it to you, the damn all reason for being calm if you've no hope at all. Okay, even if you do have hope, even if you complete knowledge, didn't Jesus Christ himself tremble in the Garden of Gethsemane? Don't we talk about that traditionally as the holy agony? And an agony, the word agony comes from the Greek word ego, meaning a contest, a struggle, a wrestling match. This is the Son of God. And this is the society we're in. It is a brilliant society. It is gifted. It is, it is shimmeringly brilliant. It does great honour to God in so many different ways and it is utterly rebellious, mutinous, dangerous and against God. I don't know how else to put this to you and you are behind them in because if society doesn't know anything about the cross, and if society regards death as something before which you should be calmed down, okay, I can think of any number of reasons for facing death calmly. You can say, well, dignity. Or like Dr. Johnson said when he was told a famous uh, London high, or a famous highwayman had made a great display of courage uh, at Tyburn, going to the gallows. And actually, he said, you'll have that, he said. You know, people are afraid to be afraid. They're afraid of being cowards. You know, so you, you put up a great show. No, but, but fine, if it's an aesthetic thing, I admire it. So, so you know, I admire it. You know, I, I'm not, I, 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 won't, I won't let the world see me cry. The world doesn't care. I still won't let it see me cry. Okay. I, I won't, no, I respect all of that. Just so long as you know. Just so long as you know that either you have an answer to this or you don't. And if you don't have an answer to it, you can be as dignified as you like. You will rot like everybody. And you'll be forgotten. Sorry. Okay. It's your own fault for coming to this. Anyone would have told you to keep away, but you can. Now I believe we have an answer to it. Okay? So this is not a hopeless talk. It's just I want you to get I want you to just get a few things clear, at least as to how I see it. And then if you don't see it that way, that's fine. That's very important. You 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 are operating in enemy territory. And, the, and what's worse is they're lovely people. I just came from a grand mass. You could, you could sense the goodness. You could bottle it. The loveliest young people. The loveliest parents. Everything was so lovely. Everything was so nice. Everything was so... Oh, careful not to talk about anything important. Needless to say, I behaved to bottle <laughs> Yeah. <clears throat> and you're facing the greatest, you're facing this tremendous adventure. You've all your life ahead of you. And I said to them, I'm not going to wish you a happy life. I'm not going to insult you. Such a stupid way. <laughs> Only Egypt's wish for a happy life. <laughs> Complete nonsense. I wish you happiness. I wish you much happiness. I wish you magnificent highs. And I want you when the lows come, not to waste them. And I want you to walk down the valley of darkness looking like what you are, the most brilliant and the most dangerous SOB walking down that valley. Okay, I want you to walk down that valley like Clint Eastwood. Okay, with the match between your teeth and the blanket over your shoulder. Happy. I want you to be happy. Have a happy life. 
to the local villagers, hit them over the head with the car. And then they'll be happy. <laughs> or feed them drink, you know? Now I'm saying to you that this is your calling, and I'm saying to you that you have an incredible opportunity to become sense. And the, the, like, the trouble is, we're told, oh, no, you, you're called to be a saint. And the minute, it's like God. The minute you mention the word saint, people switch off without knowing they've done it. It's one of those words. It seems impossible, perhaps even undesirable. Because saints, in case you didn't know, are made of plaster and are painted and lurid and dodgy paints. Okay? But, I come from Bal, where there was a few quid in the past. We have lovely statues. <laughs> a bit of marble going on there. Very nice. Very nice. Okay, saints are fascinating people. Saints are deeply flawed, usually. Saints are amazing people. Saints are walking battlegrounds to the day they die. Teresa Vizio, a slip of a girl who'd never gone anywhere or done anything in turning the eyes of the world, who went through an agony lasting, was it night or eighteen months? before she died, in which this girl from the most sheltered of backgrounds, in an enclosed convent, had a spiritual crisis that would have been recognisable to Sartre, or to, or to, I don't know, Heidegger, or to any of the great philosophers. Saints are amazing. You are called to be a saint. You are called by him directly, personally, from all eternity, to be yourself. To be yourself, as he meant you to be, is to be a saint. That is a saint. People who are not saints are less themselves because of not being a saint. So what I'm saying to you today is that you might decide to practice uh, some basic skills in disguise. Um, false mustaches are useful, I'm told. Uh, you've got a whole range of sunglasses. Uh, I suppose trench coats are traditional. Um, you're spies, you're agents. You're operating in a land without hope. And it's a land which brilliantly contrives to look like it has hope without ever stating the reason for its hope. It contrives to imply a future. Have you noticed that? There is always a future in life. There is always something amazing around the corner. That is, that is the implication brilliantly done. Who could do justice to the gifts of these people? The advertising industry. Who could do justice to their talents? The way in which glory is implied. An imminent, uh, how would you put it, satisfaction is implied. I think it was John Updike, the, the American novelist, who described the church as uh, as being like Coca-Cola advertisements. Uh, they, they, um, they manipulate thirst without ever quenching it. <laughs> but I believe that the church does contain something that will quench your thirst. I believe it does. Now the price is high for this, because you must accept You must accept the, the, the truth of the human condition, but the people around you won't be accepting it, and won't dally with it, or allowed to influence them for the most part. And when it does influence them, they will take a Prozac or something else to deal with. You must accept that you are unique. You must accept the loneliness that comes with greatness. See, these great people, great men, great women, they managed briefly to burn brightly in the way that everyone is called to burn before the Lord. And you are called to burn up before the Lord. There was a... <clears throat> Rosary group in Athen Ryan, my last parish, they were very fine people. Keith, you remember them. Were, some of them were remarkable people, as long as you didn't cross them. Uh, they were remarkable strength of the Rosary people. They were remarkable people on a great day. But they, they had this prayer, that, it's a traditional prayer for priests they used to say after Mass. I always felt that if they were annoyed with me, they said it really loud. You know? <laughs> I always got nervous if I could hear these lines. But they're, they're amazing lines. Have you heard? Um, keep them, we pray thee, dearest Lord. Keep them, for they are thine. Thy priests, whose lives burn out before thy consecrated shrine. That is seriously badass. 
the Americans. Sorry, I love Americans. <laughs> that is serious. That is serious. Somebody understands the priesthood, but I go for somebody understands Christianity. You are called to burn brightly and burn out in the house of God. And it's only by doing that you can burn forever. You must burn out. Yeah? Now you say that to anyone around you, they will have you certified. And that's actually quite difficult to do nowadays. There's a huge lack of beds in the psychiatry hospital. <laughs> but I can promise you, I can promise you that you will not be on the trolley for long. <laughs> you will get a bed. <laughs> okay, and the door will bolt. Yeah? Yeah. Now you're allowed to say that if you're talking about founding a company or becoming an early Catholic. You are not allowed to say it if you're talking about becoming the same. Okay? So this is how uncomfortable we are. I'm not demonizing the world, by the way. I'm just saying that, that we're different. I'm just saying that the world is different from God. Okay? And because we follow God, that makes us different. However badly you follow God. I want to really emphasize a few things in the night. Okay? So if you came here this evening, you probably came here for, yeah, I don't know, a more reassuring talk than this, but anyway, yeah, don't be jealous when you go home, you'll be all right. <laughs> um, I want to say to you that if you're going through a bad patch with faith and you feel distant from God, which is the same as going through it, okay? Right? I, I, I want you to consider the church's teaching and the teaching of the mystics and the saints is that, in fact, that has no effect whatever on reality unless you change your mind. You are burning out in the temple. You are beside The fact that you don't feel in the times, the fact that you feel dry, is irrelevant. This is where you have to become really tough and you have to ask them for that strange gift that is not listed of the Holy Spirit. Uh, make me think. Do you use that word the way we use it in the West? A thick man. Not stupid. Doesn't mean stupid. Yeah, thick. Make me think. Make me tough, stubborn, bullish, unwilling. Make me fit me out for this. Fit me out for it. Give me focus. Make me determined. Make me unreasonable. I mean unreasonable in the sense that great athletes, great business people, you know. I mean Steve Jobs unreasonable. You know, not unreasonable just for the sake of it, but unreasonable because you have a vision. Do you know? Ask for that. Ask him for that. You know? And, and pray for that because you're, you're going to need it. But if you ask him for it, he'll give it to you. And if he gives it to you, you'll accomplish your mission, whatever that mission is. Now consider this, consider this, is that even if you're having difficulty in prayer, if you're down about that, that's prayer. You see, we tend to forget that God isn't like us. We tend to think of prayer as being like a human relationship. I don't talk to him, okay? Even in a couple, who are of a certain age, you won't have as much conversation, maybe, because they know each other. Okay? It can mean that you're comfortable together. But it can also simply mean that it suits him to keep you there for the moment. He's, that's the way he kind of sense of humor the guy has. It, it suits him to keep you there. Okay, what's that to you if it does? If you can't pray, now, if you, do you know that normal diary of a country priest? Go oh, that point is made in there. Go oh, back in there. It's a very good point. If you can't pray what you're trying to pray, and you can't pray, and you're down about it, you're praying. Okay, now you said that to a, to a human being, to a spouse, right? You know, you never talk to me. I want to talk to you. I want to talk to you, but I don't talk to you. And I must admit I'm down about it. Okay, that's something, but I don't know how far that'll go. Okay, I tell you that. Okay? It doesn't sound very promising as a line of conciliation, right? But God isn't human. God is pure spirit, pure intellect, pure will. He knows you. He knows what you're doing. If you can't pray and you're down about it, you're praying. You're, 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 you're suffering more. I, 
hey, look, I'm, I'm just giving you a taste of this stuff. I just want you to consider. You're probably doing way better than you think. Okay? Now, don't, don't get too uppity, okay? You know, leave a bit of room for the room. But, but you're probably doing a way better than you think. You're probably in a better place than you think. Right? You're probably in a better place than you think. God is not human in that sense. I know Jesus Christ, the incarnation of the rest of it. You know, it's not the same thing as now what I'm talking about. He knows. He knows. So if you feel dry, just hand it back to him. Okay? You can hand that many lines, you don't have time for this stuff. And you can't be drawing attention to yourself if there's no good reason for doing it. Because you want to be clear as to what in you want to die on. Okay? I know, another American I just can't resist. Okay? I mean, you want to think these strategically and carefully. So, as, as one leading certain dad said to me, he's a believer, comes from a believing family, he's asked how he got through school. He said, I joked and I joked. He got to. And he was quite assured, 16 years old. An excellent agent. <laughs> yeah, he had a good call. And quietly doing good, good, good in his own way. But how do you know what you're meant to be doing? This is another thing. You know, agents here are given a mission. And they fulfill the mission. Either the mission is fulfilled or it isn't. You have to be given a different mission. How do you know what it is? You, 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 the whole point of your apostolic purpose on earth, not, you know, could be the conversion of one friend. You don't know that that's not the case. But you think, oh my crikey, I give so much time to the church and this is all I have. Just, just one person came back to the church. Like, you don't get to make that call, I'm sorry. Now, I know where you're coming from. We, you know, we go on the same, you're, you, you go on the same ministry, don't you? It's the spirit in some ways. You know, you want the big crowns, the rads, okay? Right, do you remember? First 50 years, in the 20th century, the Irish church, the big crowds, the rads, but you can't trust it. I leave it there. I just want to say to you that this tape will self destruct. Okay? <laughs> In five minutes. <laughs> yeah? You have a mission. You have something to do. Find out what it is to do. Don't assume, because you're not a teenager anymore, that you know the mission. You may be, you may know it, you may be mistaken about it. Ask them to show you what he wants you to do. The most thing he wants is that you convert your heart in yourself. But, in apostolic terms, he will almost certainly have a mission at extra, as they say outside you as well. So you have the conversion, that's everything caused to that. Self-conversion. But you, you will also have something in mind that you have to do. You may have done it, you may be doing it, but don't assume it. S stay ready. Check the post, as they say. Okay? Good luck. And if you get caught, we don't know you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I said, oh, that's the father's son, the police,